Good morning, I'm Jeff Chunglow, Director of Veteran Services for the Town of Arlington. I've invited veterans from different eras of conflict to join me today to discuss their feelings on Memorial Day as well as their military service. Joining me today is Ray DeRosas, a U.S. Marine Corps veteran from the Korean War. So thanks for being here, Ray. Thank you, Jeff, for asking me. Sure. It's to be here. So uh, you served in Korea. Yes, I did. Okay, and you were with the Marine Corps. Can you tell us what you did while you were serving in the Marine Corps? Well, I was in a weapons company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And ordinarily, I was a rifleman. My, uh, that was my spec number, my specialty. And when I left Korea, I'll get back to Korea in just one second. When I left Korea, I became a squad leader in a rifle platoon. But in Korea, when they, uh, uh, we went up to the front lines, they needed ammo carriers for the 81 millimeter mortars. And so I was selected there. And so what we, I did, I was an ammo uh, carrier. Now, just a prelude to, uh, prelude to that, uh, on our way up to the front, we were in this uh, railway car built by the Japanese, probably about 1845 sometime. It was, it was just a pigsty. But anyway, we were on that, and we were told by the veterans who had come back, and they were going home, to fill your uh, uh, utilities with C rations, K rations, assault rations, and, 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 and cigarettes, because they wouldn't get them over the line too much. So anyway, the, the point is, it's a rickety... Uh, 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 railroad, and we had to make stops. They're probably throwing the wood in for crying out into the uh, engine. Now, every stop, these poor people, wretched people, and rags and little babies and everything else, they were begging, begging for food. And so we were giving them a C rack and a K rack and so forth. I'm telling you, it was a, it was a, a sad s situation. It was tragic people. But anyway, by the time we got up to Monsani, which is the breaking up point going to the line, we, we, we didn't have any more. And then you had no, had no more food. However, we had our cigarettes. Now, from there, we went up to uh, the guns and so forth. And uh, you have to first stop to give you a, a background of the guns. When you get to the guns, 81s, so there was a, a terrific surge by the Chinese to take this hill, which we were guarding, uh, protecting, called Boulder City. And we were firing like crazy. And you have to understand, artillery fire, 4.2 mortar fire, 81 mortar fire, 60 millimeter uh, uh, firing, hand grenade firing, machine gun firing, shorter, uh, uh, small arms firing, and so forth. Now, because I'll get back to that in a moment. Now, we're making these runs from the guns to bring it to a, the depot where the, uh, uh, the, the ammo was held. And we load up on the 6x and then come by what is called 76 Alley, which was a uh, which was the main road back to the guns. We called it 76 Alley because the, uh, uh, the Chinese had it zeroed in, the Chinese communists. Well, anyway, my last run, this is what I'm talking about now, my last run there, we, uh, we unloaded and so forth and so on, and then we went back for more. Now, I'm going back, we hit a checkpoint, as always, and so there was a, uh, we loaded up again and came back. Hit the checkpoint, and the marina checkpoint said, look it, on your way back, would you bring me a pack of Lucky Strike? Because everyone's giving me camels here. I want Lucky Strike. And just as he said that, a Chinese mortar came out and hit him and hit the hole. So we took off flying down that road back to the guns. But that was the first mortar, the second mortar, incrementally following us down the road. And we knew that eventually they were going to hit us. And that just before you get to the guns, they hit us. Now, I got blown out of the truck. Only it's always a light, that's all I know. And the next thing I remember is I was trying to get to my feet, and it wasn't doing very well. Now, our executive of, uh, officer, Jungle Jim Sanzo, he came over, and he's in my face. And I know he was yelling at me, but you know it sounded far away with all the noise. And plus, this is 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. The Chinese never attacked during the day because we were slaughtering them, our Air Force. And so... He, they attacked in the morning and night, bugles and everything, that type of thing. Now, as he's uh, yelling in my face, and uh, we were fighting by uh, flares, that's, that's, that's the only thing we could see, this garish light, he's putting my helmet back on my head and my rifle back on my shoulder. He's saying, Marine, Marine, 
can you hump the animal? And the last words I can remember was saying, yes, sir, yes, sir. Then I blanked out. Next thing I remember, I'm on a cart, and I'm in a tent. It's very quiet. And there were three men, probably corpsmen, but I didn't know anything about that. I sat up, my helmet, my rifle, my uh, flak jacket were all by the cart. And I just sat up, and one of those corpsmen came up to me, sat beside me, offered me a cigarette. I didn't smoke, but I took it. Because in those days, if someone offered you a cigarette, it was a sign of friendship. So anyway, I took it, and he said, how are you doing? I said, fine. I think I said, fine. That's the last thing I remember. Next thing I remember, I'm back with the guns again. And it's the last, uh, last night of the war. And I don't know how I got there. I don't know anything about anything. I just lost my memory. And anyway, we get hot. All I remember is we had hot chow, hot chow. So uh, I'm telling you, it was raining. When it rains in Korea and in the Orient, those, those raindrops are the size of nickels and quarters. I mean, they're coming down. But we had the hot chow. Suddenly, more did start coming in again. And I'll spare you the eloquence of a Marine reply of what we said <laughs> to those guys over in <laughs> the Chinese. Anyway, it was, uh, I can't believe this. We dived in the mud and everything else. And so the next, and then that's all I remember. The next thing I remember, uh, we're coming offline. Uh, here's a couple of uh, uh, auxiliary uh, stories here to this. Coming offline, I, I worked for a, d a demo man, a demolition man after the war. And uh, he, uh, we were exploding, we were the DMZ, we, we were creating the DMZ. We had to explode all our fortifications and then move back a mile and they did the same thing so forth and so on. So I worked for him. Well, before I did that, I was in a tent with in the, in the, a couple of my buddies and one, uh, a Marine from 7th Regiment, two series here, he comes over, he has a Life magazine in his hand. It's about two weeks after the war ended. He said, look at this Life magazine, I should have brought it with me. Life magazine had a feature I have at home, a feature of the Marines uh, at, uh, on, the, on um, Boulder City. And he, the kids, he's a BAR man, big guy. And he said, look at that, he's leading men off the line. And there's a corpsman on the right side, uh, 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 column of twos, he's on the, on the, on the right side and the column's on the left. He said, look at my mother sent me. Holy gee. Well, uh, anyway, I, I have that home. Now, 20 years later, I pick up a, uh, an, an ancient advocate. In the advocate, here's a picture of Joe Egan, a friend of mine. He, uh, I, I think I told you about he was killed. He was killed. Uh, he wasn't killed in Korea, but he, he, he died later on. But he was wounded. But we were on the same hill. He was on he was on Boulder City when I was there, but we didn't know it. And he was telling his story to some reporter from the Arlington Advocate on Memorial Day. So I called him on the telephone. We went down the American Legion, had a few beers, and that's the first time I ever talked about Korea or anything else. And we talked about uh, what a rat hole it was and everything else. Sure. But yeah. And so that was that was that was my Korean War experience. Wow. Oh. So, so let me back up just a little right. bit. So what made you want to join the, the military to begin with? All right, now, when I was, I was about 17, I wanted to join the Marine Corps. My father was killed in World War II. He was torpedoed, believe it or not, off the coast of uh, North Carolina by the German U-boat 160, and the, and the uh, name of the uh, uh, German U-boat command was Lassen's. Well, anyway, uh, he was from Argentina. And he was a foreign press correspondent, actually, when he came up. And he went to Columbia uh, uh, School of Journalism. And then he met my mother going out to school. Had a good job. But when the Depression came, and uh, he's, a, he's a man, a very intelligent man, spoke excellent English, but with a Spanish accent. Now, you had PhDs speaking uh, King's English, uh, selling apples on the corner, couldn't get a job. So what he did was, the only job he could get before, if, unless he wanted to go back to Argentina, he got a job, he, he, he took the Merchant Marine. Okay. And so when the war broke out, here he was. He came to three war zones, and, he, we, and, and nothing happened to him off the coast of the cap. It was uh, uh, March 29th, Palm Sunday, 1942, and he, he was uh, listed as mi missing in action at first. And then uh, they, uh, I f we found out how he died and everything else. He was. Uh, he was, he was thrown off the ship, 
and uh, and the, the three of his uh, uh, shipmates found him later on in the water about midnight. They pulled him on, but by the morning he had died, and rigor mortis had set in. They, we got all this information, you know, later on, naturally, and they, they shipped him over to the side and so forth. Well, anyway, so that's that's my that's my point about going to the Marine Corps. When the when the Korean War broke out, I was 17. My mother said, "Look at." <coughs> It's in rhythm, you know, you follow that. Can you just wait a year or two and so forth and so on? So I listened to her, I said, okay. Now I have to say something else too. My, <coughs> when we were living down in New York, I, I come from New York, my father got killed. And so we were there, I went to a dealer, saw Christian Brothers School around the corner and so forth. But in about 1947, things were getting very tough. And then there was an epi epidemic of smallpox in New York. So my mother sent uh, my older sister, my older brother, my younger brother and I, up to my uh, uh, family, the Coffees, and that's where we're living on. Anyway, I didn't join, but a year or so later, <coughs> I was in a hall with Johnson's, and a policeman, or a couple of friends of mine, and a policeman came in, and uh, I didn't have anything in front of me. He said, uh, how come you're not drinking? I said, I'm ordering. Grabbed me around the neck, pulled me out. We had a little tangle. And so they took me up to the station. And, and anyway, it all, to make it all short, I went to court. They had me for trespassing, resisting arrest, uh, whatever. <coughs> and so my lawyer said, look at the, the, the police wanted to send me. Hey, I love the police. I want to say that right now. And uh, I'm all for them. But at this particular time, I had a certain problem. Anyway, uh, they wanted to send me to Walpole. And so my lawyer said, look at this young man has always wanted to be a Marine. Why don't you let him join the Marine Corps? And so the judge says, hey, the Marines are fighting in Korea. Send him to Korea. Or the Marine, or the, the captain of, of the, uh, the police force was delivered. But anyway, <laughs> he says, if you can get a clearing from the Marine Corps, you can go in. So I, I rushed out to the Marine Corps in the South Station across the street. And I gave him all the information. He said, look, we can't take you because your case is pending. I said, look, it's Sergeant. If you can't take me, and I go back there and say they can't take me, you know, I'm going to bind here. I said, look, I won't let you down. He said, look, a kid, it's not a question of letting me down. It's the Marine Corps. I said, look, how about a break? So he looked at me. <laughs> he said, okay, signs the waiver. I go back to the courthouse, Cambridge Court. I give it to the critical court. He looks at it. <laughs> he's, he's ripping because he wanted me to go off. <laughs> he throws it back at me. You son of a gun. Anyway, <laughs> that's how I ran out of it happy, and that's how I joined the Marine Corps. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, so you were one of those go-to-war, go-to-jail guys. Yeah, exactly, and I was a high school dropout. Even though I have two advanced uh, degrees in literature now, at that time, I didn't have a thought in my head. Okay. So um, what were your feelings about basic training? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Well, the Marine Corps, it, it's, not, uh, uh, it's, it's not a luxury camp. They, they, they were very tree with their hands. Uh, the Marine Corps was very tough training, but very good training. And uh, I, I can't explain everything to you, but they were tough. And they call you out 3 o'clock in the morning, okay, get out there. It'd be, uh, the sun be, be, say, 110 in the shade, right? And then you're not, if the red flag is up on the... Uh, on the drill field, you're not supposed to go out there. The guy would come into the barracks, fall out, rifles and everything else, <laughs> you're out there, and you're really sweaty. And he's saying, get your two left feet or so forth. <laughs> anyway, it, it was a tough situation, but I'll, I'll say this for them. They trained me and they trained me well, they trained every Marine. And, and here's the example of this. Going to Korea, it, uh, it took 15 days to go there. It was a trip. And we were down the hole, and we had to go up on deck. Every morning, we went up for rifle inspection. The Army, we had some Army uh, uh, contingent there, too. And they had their, uh, their rifles broken down, put in it into a sea bag, and they never looked at a rifle. Now, you may know about the Chosen Reservoir before I got there. <coughs> the, Chos the Marines were, were surrounded by 250,000 uh, Chinese, and it was 40 blaze, uh, degrees below zero, they fought their way out. The 8th Army ran, they threw down their weapons and they just ran. 
that not that they weren't in as, as brave as the Marines, they just weren't trained. Mm -hmm. Well, the Marine training is the best. And there's a, there's a, there was a, a colonel in the Army, and they had a, a story about him on TV. In the background, they had a, uh, a picture of the Marines coming out of the chosen reservoir. He says, I bet you're the only, uh, bet I'm the only Army colonel who has a picture of the Marines so behind me. Because he loved the Marines, he knew the training. Sure. And the, and the uh, ground air support was terrific. Well, that's okay. best training. So, when you were introduced to the military through through basic training, um, what's one of the big takeaways or, or something that really surprised you about yourself that you never knew? Well, I'll tell you, I had a, I was a glib kid. It's like getting around that. And my brother, my older brother had gone to Paris Island before I did, and so he comes back and I'm going, I'm going to go in a few weeks. And he said, Ray, he says, I have, uh, I have one word of advice for you. I said, what's that, Dick? Keep your big mouth shut. And so down there, that's one thing you learn. But I learned camaraderie down there that, uh, you know, you're, it's, it's a unit. And it's not just fighting for America. You fight for the Marine beside you. You know, you need them. Yeah. And in and, and, uh, and Goodbye Darkness by William Manchester, his... Uh, his uh, epic of the uh, his experience in World War Two. He says any man who doesn't have a friend in the Marine Corps is doomed. He's damned. You know, you you, you, you just stick together. Mm -hmm. It was that cohesion. Yeah, and it was a it was sort of brotherly love. Yep. You know, it, it comes down to that. You so, need each other. So when you when you saw your brother come home after joining the Marine Corps, what was your first impression? Oh, he was sharp. Oh, was lead, yeah. He was, <laughs> you know, he was really, he was always sharp kidding, but he was really sharp. And, and when he wasn't around, he didn't have his uniform on. I, I used to try his shirt on, you know, look in the mirror. <laughs> say, oh, jeez, I'm going to be a Marine. And I'm going to tell you something else. When I went into combat, just before we went into combat, you know, Pete, did see people talk about fear and everything else, but I was exhilarated because I said to myself, I'm a, I'm a young man here. I'm going to into combat as a United States Marine. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that can wear off a little bit. <laughs> but I mean, uh, that initial feeling. You know, sure. That's what you get. Uh, so where, where exactly did you serve through, throughout your career? So I know you went to basic training, Paris Island, um, okay, and then- so Paris Island, I went to Camp Lejeune, and I was in 4.2 mortars. They put me in there. And from there, we used to go on these excursions of uh, 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 cold water training uh, and then uh, 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 hot uh, hill training. Mm -hmm. uh, cold water, we went up to uh, Labrador. And if you've ever been to Labrador, I don't know if it's the same in all over the country, but you, it's like walking on pie crust. Uh, that was, and, uh, you know, I was in Fort Deuce and, and, uh, and, and we carried the base plate and, and, the, mm -hmm. and, and everything, the gun. So, yeah, uh, that was that was one form of training. So about did. how much did that equipment weigh? Uh, oh, the old yeah. yeah. Did it work? Oh, did, how much did it weigh? Oh, jeez, I, I, I can't tell the weight, but I'm gonna tell you, it was heavy. <laughs> like carrying across like something, but it was really heavy. And and the gunner, he didn't carry anything. We had a base plate, the, the, the gun, and the tripod. The tripod was fairly light, but that gunner, that base plate, he got. And so then from there, we went down to Viegas, Puerto Rico, for hot weather training and so forth in the hills and everything else. And, uh, and then we came back. And I, every day I was volunteering for Korea, this friend of mine, they do, we were buddies. We, every day we go into the first sergeant, we're volunteering for Korea. Okay, get the heck out of here, I heard you. One day we go in there, hey, you guys, you idiots are going to Korea and get out of my hair. You know? So that's, that's how we get to Korea. And I'm going to tell you something, too. We traveled through his class from Boston to, uh, to California, to Camp Pendleton. We had a, I had my own, uh, my own suite, and, 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 and he, was, uh, he had, on the other side of the aisle of the train, he had his own suite. And you know what the, uh, uh, the, uh, the food allowance was for four days? $20. And it lasted us too, you know. Wow. In those days, you know, 15 cents for a breakfast, that type of thing. And so that's how we got the campaign. Hmm. Um, so while you were away, 
How did you keep in touch with family and friends? Oh, you, you're right. You know, you're, you're right all the time. There's, there's no getting around that. Yeah, and and you, that's you know that's one thing you crave when you when you're in the Marine Corps, any any service, I'm sure. Letters from home. Oh, Lordy, you know, you write him, you write him, you write him. We used to get him, and uh, well, it's interesting. When I was down at Paris Island, the, the DI. He looks up my name, and he see, he's sitting on top of the cot, and we're all around, and he's, he's throwing the letters out. Hey, Joe, sis, Tim, that, so forth and so on. And he says, comes to DeRosa's. He says, what kind of name is that? I said, it's Spanish. He says, it's Spanish. I said, I'm Spanish and Irish, sir. My, my family's Irish. My mother's Irish. He says, you're a spaghetti bender. And he flings it. <laughs> so from that time, I was a spaghetti bender. But I mean, that's the way he talked in those days, too. But the letters from home, you wrote. That's all you did. Okay. No phone calls? No phone call. Phone, I never thought of a phone call. And it were a nickel, too. But I'm, I'm sure from California to, to Boston would have been probably 25 cents. But n never got a phone call. I never phoned. No one ever phoned me. So when you were in Korea, how was the mail service? Were you getting regular mail? Or, you know, was it, w yeah, we, we you know, did you have to wait there. periods? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we got regular mail, and we had this, someone had set up this with batteries, and he had like a little radio, and it went our tent after the war. And we had this radio station, we only got one. It was Radio Maple Leaf. It was a, it was a Canadian uh, uh, program. And he used to play all kinds of music and everything else. And so, and he used to call himself, this is Happy Jack. From uh, from the Happy Bird, some uh, from Japan. He's in. So we used to say, "Yeah, you're happy. You're in Japan, you bum." Anyway, he was. Uh, he played these songs, and one one song we heard, there was some odd music. Bing Crosby recorded a song called "Some of These Days You're Gonna Miss Me, Honey." Well, suddenly a Japanese comes on, and he's singing in Japanese Bing Crosby song, and he's and he's hitting it grace note for grace note, and ad living and every. Gee, I couldn't believe. I, I'd love to have a copy of that record. Hmm. Yeah, but anyway, that that was uh, that, that was it for Korea. As far as Interesting. But the thing you missed, you missed home. You missed home cooking. You missed your family and so forth. You missed girls. You know, j just to say, of women for crying out loud. And uh, oh, Lordy, that was it. And then meals, food, food, food. You know, we used to, we got sea rations a lot and so forth. Then we had something called beef and grease. I loved it. I really just ate that up, and I, I don't know what it was, but we ate it anyway. And then the, the thing I really missed too was music. I loved music, and so you know that was, oh, those are the things you miss. Sure. And uh, what are you going to do? So what did you do in your free time? Well, what, what in the free time? And how much I get sent from weapons company. What we did was we had to dig. Uh, uh, Adjacent emplacements, as I said, and uh, and we went out now. A little story about that: we had to go out and, and dig up. We had to make new trench lines, in other words. So when I was still with uh, when I was still with weapons company before I went to the DMZ, we used to go out and dig. <clears throat> One time we were in, and it was hot and so forth. Anyway, we were in single file. We came to this pass, and only a, a single file of uh, men could could uh, traverse it. And we're halfway, it's up about a quarter of a mile anyway. We get halfway there, and who meets us but this Korean woman? And she has a baby on her back, or front, I forget. She had a big bag of uh, uh, clothing she was washing. And so we're yelling to the first, uh, our first sergeant, Taylor. We didn't like him. He was a son of a guy at the time. I didn't like him. And so we said, come on, Taylor. Tell her to go back. It, was, it would have been a long walk for her. He turns around and he says, to the rear. So the whole platoon, 43 men, we all go back, we all go back to the end, right? And we wait and she comes and she comes out to the exit. And he, as he, she comes out, he tips his helmet to her. I said to myself, you know, I changed my opinion of him. I thought, you know, that's a real man there. Because cause the other guys didn't like, I didn't like it either, but you know, it was so hot and everything else. So when I worked with the demo man, he was a great, he was, he was a warrant officer, and he'd be making the explosives, and I'd be helping him uh, 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 firing a hole and all that. I knew his hands were shaking, you know. But 
We used to talk, and he said to me once, "What do you plan to do when you when you when you get out of the Marine Corps?" As I said, I, I said, I said, oh, I, say, I, I, I live from day to day in the Marine Corps. I know he had a wife and children; he was going home too. But me, I didn't, I didn't see any future, really. Okay. Here I am, you know. And then I get sent up to the DMZ. And then in the DMZ, with patrols, 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 and every time you're out there. See, we were up, to, up in the hills, and we were what, and, and the DMZ was out there, and across, we could see the villages out there, North Korean villages, and we had to report everything they were doing and so forth, and that's what I did. And there was one incident I, I can tell you about, but it had to do with, with the Chinese. I met, we used to meet. We go out like a, there was like a catwalk out there, and uh, these Chinese would come out, and we go out and meet them because, you know, just to show them, uh, we were Marines, you know, whatever. And one was very old, and one was very young. I always thought that about the, the Orientals out there, the Koreans and so forth. They either were very old or very young. I never saw any middle aged Anyway, this next story. We were, uh, <coughs> what was I going to do? Oh, it was Christmas Eve, and we were back, and we were going to have a little party and everything else, and we were on the hill, and, uh, and this Captain Goyd, she was Jewish, and he had a ha helmet full of medals. He was a Chicago University graduate, great guy, and some, he went by some Marines who come by, and someone yelled out, Christ killer. Well, oh, geez, next, next night. We have a big meeting up in the, they, they built a mess hall up there, concert, concert house. He said, look at you guys. Uh, I don't care if you guys are Christians, Jewish, Jews for Jesus. We're, all I know is we're all Marines here. And but that, at that time, we were all combat Marines, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, we're Marines. You know, we're none of this, none of this religious stuff and so forth and so on. But the next day, he had us put our uh, entrenching tools like shovels mm -hmm. up on the hill. <laughs> Taken down, I don't know what, uh, just to remind us of that. But that, that's that's the experience. Hmm. And then I came home. I read four books. Two. It was a 15-day trip. I set across the Pacific, and two coming back. I read uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, and uh, the uh, uh, Black Boy Jungle, Battle Cry, and the K Mutiny. You know, you know, books I had read in many years, I guess. So anyway, that, that was that. Uh, what else can I say about Oh, coming back, going over the Pacific Ocean, fulfilled its name with beautiful, quiet, you know, nice sailing. Coming back, we're about a day out, and I just I had just eaten chow, wine chow, and suddenly the whole ship starts, around. I almost went, everything's iron, everything's iron in, uh, on a ship, as you probably know, you're in the Navy. And the bulkheads and everything else, uh, boom, I go down the stairs, I'm, I'm just holding up a life. We hit a typhoon. My breakfast came up, and I went down, down to the hole, and I get down to the bottom rack, and I couldn't move. And so I was, uh, they had put me on mess duty, I was a corporal, but they put me on mess duty. My whole platoon was on mess duty. And so they're calling me on the intercom, Corporal DeRose report to the mess tech. I said, you see. Anyway, one morning, they come down. Was this typhoon lasts about three or four days. I get a light shone in my face, and it's the uh, officer of the day. He said, you Corporal DeRose? I said, yes, sir. He said, that you want to Yeah, haven't you heard? And I said, uh, Lieutenant, I can't move. He must have seen the greenish. He said, okay, when you feel better, come up. And that's when I came back to the States. Well, interesting. <laughs> Those little anecdotes. But there was one guy, I gotta tell you, he was in the hopper. Every time I went in there, I had to crawl to get in. He was on the hopper every time I went in there. I thought he was dead. He just kept, anyway. If, if you ever hit a typhoon, you're seasick. You wanna die. Mm -hmm. you, know, you didn't care if you died or not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's so what would you like people to know about your service? My service. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, that's a good question. That service, I'm going to tell you. You know, I was a, as I said, I, I was an immature kid. I really was, and I was. Uh, I don't know. I, I took things for granted. 
Uh, I wasn't I wasn't that serious, you know. Uh, but when I got when I came home, I became very serious and even religious to a certain extent, which I had never really been. But I, of course, I was a Catholic, raised a Catholic, and I was still a Catholic and all that. But I don't know. I just I just started thinking about I don't know what life was really all about, and I had a very tough ad adjustment. Uh, I started, I, in fact, after a while, I started to drink like the rest of my friends, we all. We saw who were heavy hitters, we were drinking a lot. We couldn't find a job at first, and we were a little bit envious of these guys who didn't go in the service, and you know, and they had, they had jobs, they had girlfriends, they had automobiles. Jeez, we had nothing. And so we started to think about that too. And, and so then uh, I developed a speech problem. I started to speak. And I knew what I wanted to say, but it didn't come out right. I said, oh, jeez. And so I, I'd be home. Then I got a job in the town working as a laborer. So I, I was OK that way. But I'd be home alone. And the phone would ring. I'd be terrified. Jesus, I can't answer the phone again. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. What, I said, I don't know what's happening to me. And so anyway, I was going with this girl. She was an artist. And I was thinking, how am I going to break out of this? And so my brother, he went to BC, and the, some of my older friends, his friends, they were at BC. They were saying, why don't you go over to BC and you know, go to school again? I didn't have any confidence. I said, are you serious? I took a college course, neglected my studies, cut classes, uh, uh, cut, uh, skipped school. You know, that's the kind of kid I was. But So I said, no, they'll never take me. So anyway, I was thinking about that. I was going with this girl, and she was a BC uh, uh, an artist. And I said to her one day, you know, I said, you know, maybe I'd like to go to school. I mean, I'm thinking about that. She said, oh, she said, he said, you're a laborer. You're a high school dropout. You'll never go to school. And that sort of ticked me off. <laughs> so I said, maybe I'll try. So I went over to BC, and the uh, dean of admission said, you know, you, have, you took great courses, but your courses, I put it, in, I put it in mildly, they said, uh, are not what we'd say are adequate for a college student, uh, and mm -hmm. so forth. That's so always said that effect. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. But the Korean War had only been over three years by that time. He said, look, we want to help veterans. If you'll take some special courses that were known for algebra, geometry, English, and then take the college boards, see how you can do, we'll, we'll give you a shot. I said, OK, so I did. I went to, I went to Newman Prep, and I took algebra and geometry. And they thought I was a mathematical genius. But <laughs> I boom, 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 it came back to me. And I was one of the leaders. I was, there were two of us. One, Leahy, he was in the Air Force. And we were, and, he, and, the, and, the, and the instructor device sent the bar, two, two classes. And, uh, and we, he put a uh, problem on the board. And we see who could uh, do it first and so forth. And, and we had teams and everything else. But what he didn't understand was I was just regurgitating what I thought I hadn't learned. But I had learned it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it mine's a computer. And then when I was in graduate school, when I finished all my work, I, I went, when I was going for my MA in, in English literature, I all my, but I had two more prerequisites. One was an oral examination, which was going to be about seven or eight months in the future. But one was coming up very shortly, a French reading exam. So I went to the head of the department, Dr. Mahoney. I had had him as a freshman. He said, look, they're, they're giving you a French, uh, all French program over here in uh, this summer at BC. Why don't you sign up and see how you can do? Mm -hmm. I said, OK, well, I did. And I booked my, I, I, she said, if I had studied as hard in high school as I did over there, I would have been a dollar victory if I got <laughs> Anyway, I put my brains, and the irregular verse started to come back. I said, geez, you know, I know this stuff. And, st and well, make it all short. When I took the exam, it was on Shakespeare, thank God. Anyway, I aced it. I said, yeah, I, I should have kept up with it, but I said, that's the end. I said, thank you. And then when I took my oral examination, and that, was, that was a really brief, I could have taken a written one, but a friend of mine, he had, he had, he had taken his MA years before. He was a World War II guy. And he said, look, take the oral, because if you take the written and you start to write something that's not right, you know, you're going the wrong way, you're done for, but if you take the oral and, and, and you miss a point, they can bring you up and you can get back. You know, that's what I did. I took the oral, and uh, I, I did very well there too. And very so, good. Yeah.
And I mean, for a high school dropout, you know, and my principal, uh, Ralph Duplin, he had been a Navy commander in World War II. What a great guy. He was too, he's a tough guy. <laughs> and he was a math man. But he didn't, when I, when I first got the job there at, at Winthrop High School, uh, he didn't, he always said, to, all he said to me, oh, in three years, he said to me, call me Mr. DeRose and so forth and so on, never say anything too much to me after that. And then when, when I got uh, my, uh, whatever you get, uh, you know, you're there for, for full time, he started to call me Ray. When I got my MA, he was so proud of me. He got on the intercom, <laughs> the whole school, and he says, and, and I, was, I, was, I was in my homeroom, you know what I mean? He says, now hear this, now hear this. <laughs> you know, Navy clock. He says, uh, Mr. DeRose has received his MA in English literature. We want to congratulate him. She said, I could have called him to the desk, you know. So they all afford her. Very good. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Excellent. So I have a couple other questions about your service. More about the conflict. The so, conflict. yeah, so the Korean War. Korean War has often been referred to as the Forgotten War. So, so how did you feel, number one, you're serving in Korea, but then seeing how the veterans from World War II were treated coming home versus your time in service? Well, that was part of the adjustment, too, because I think I may have told you in you know, other times, but when I got home, no one, no one even knew I'd been to Korea. And half the other people didn't know I was in the Marine Corps. My uncle, my uncle John, I loved him. He's a great guy. Years later, I was talking with him. He said, uh, yep. you went to Korea? <laughs> you know, I said, yeah, I was in Korea. But that was the way it was. You, know, you, just, uh, you were just, you were nothing. They didn't even know who you were. And, and you felt that way. You, know, you felt isolated. I felt bad for the, terrible for the uh, Vietnam guys. I mean, they attacked those poor guys. Uh, that, that was treasonous. But for us, it was just uh, isolation. It was indifference. So I, I, I think we felt that. Yeah, that was the only place we, we felt really good was down in the American Legion. And before we got there, there were just World War II guys down there, and some guys from the Depression and all that. But when the Korean War guys get in there, boy, uh, it was standing room only. And when you went down, you talk about secondhand smoke. You, were, you worked there in those days. Uh, you didn't even have to light up. You just take a deep breath. As, as one actor said to another one, don't any of you guys ever inhale, you know? <laughs> anyway, yeah, but, but you're right. Well, you felt that way. And it was just, I felt, I don't know how I felt, but it was something I, I just couldn't, couldn't grasp, you know? And my, my family was all concerned about me, you know? They, they didn't know what to do. And they, they, they were so patient with me and everything else, but I was very edgy, very edgy. You know, I, I, I could, I could go like that. When I was working for the town, one of the foremen, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't the most uh, affable guy in the world anyway, but I, we stayed away from each other. But one day I was working on Pleasant Street by that cemetery there, right by the anchor, by the church, on the Col Coletta Church. But anyway, it's a hot day, and the, the wall was there. There was a wall there. I was hitting it with a, a sledgehammer or something, and Koba, he came by. He said, hey, come on. Uh, something about it. He criticized me. I took the crew, you know how heavy they are. I took that crew by, I flung it at him. <laughs> Just boom, it missed him. I, he took off. I, you know, but that, that's why I was, you know, instead of saying, oh, forget it, well, which I would do today, yeah, I wouldn't care, you know. I care. But in those days, so I couldn't say anything to me much. And the drinking and everything. But, you know, I drank. It's interesting. I was not a drinker, thank God. I couldn't keep up with the big boys in the corner. But I tried to. But when I was drinking, I was happy. I was a happy drinker. That's why I drank. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt good. So, but there were some guys that were just the opposite. They got a little mean. But no, I just felt good, so that's why I drank. But I'll be in, a friend of mine, he was uh, Fred Cranfus. He was in the second airport over there. And we were talking once. He had been a big drinker, too, when he came back and everything else. And he said he was in a bar room one one morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, he was drinking down the Green Parrot down at Cambridge somewhere, and he just happened to turn around. It was a nice sunny day, and this young man with, with in a stroller with a little child in it, he just happened to stop to rearrange something in the toddler. He looked at him, 
And he said, looking at that guy, he said, you know, I'm 20, 22 years old. And he's like, uh, what am I doing in a bar room? He said, they just put the drink down, and I left, and I never went back. And that's the way I felt. One day I just woke up, I said, oh, gee, I, I, I just got to get out of this rut. Sure. And that's when I started to work at all, you know. Yeah, because at that time you didn't have any real support services available oh, for veterans. No one had anything. No, I didn't know what. The, I didn't even what was going on with me. You know, it's, I never. I was a glib kid. Now I can't talk. You know, geez, I said, "Fuck, crying. What's going on here?" Something was something was happening to me, but I didn't know what. And uh, I was scared too a little bit. And so anyway, and then I met my future wife. And so we started going steady and everything, and she was a very steady influence on me. And inter interestingly enough, she was a Baptist, and I'm a Catholic. And so uh, she, uh, she finally converted ultimately, but the mother, the mother was a bad, and the mother hated me. Not because of uh, me, but because I was Catholic. And so I used to go up to the house and bring the bell, go in, and, and she'd be coming to go to Mass with me, and, and I could hear the mother upstairs, you go to your own church, my oh, Lordy. You know, there was that kind of conflict, too. Mm -hmm. And that, that lasted for about 20 years with her. The father, he didn't care. He was a congregate, he was a nice guy, you know. I just, I get along with him well, but the mother. You know, there was some uh, friction there, you know. Hmm. So if you could pass along some advice to the younger generation now about m serving in the military, what would you say to him? Gee, because I, I, I don't know what the military is today, but I don't think the Marine Corps has changed that much. But in, in, in structure and technique, it has, you know, weapons and everything else. But I, I think the core value is there. You know, love America. Jesus, that's the first thing. Love the Marine Corps. You know, have this, uh, have this uh, love, uh, if you will, this appreciation of, uh, of being, uh, even being in the military, you know, defending your country. Uh, what higher can you go? How higher can you go than that, other than becoming a religious or something, you know, that type of thing? Mm -hmm. But it is a form of uh, it's secular religion almost, you know, the Marine Corps. It's you know, it's, you know, what Truman said about the uh, two things about the Marine Corps. You know, when, when he when he denigrated them, they're killing, they're, they're dying in Korea, and he's saying he called them bellhops to the Navy, and then he said the Marine Corps has a greater uh, propaganda system than Joseph Stalin. And so that may be true, you know, I don't know. But, uh, but they live up to it anyway, that's all I know. And I was, I was so proud. And Lee Marvin, Jerome Powell, those actors and so forth, uh, Brian Keith, uh, uh, Steve McQueen, those guys, uh, George C. Scott, they all talk about the Marine Corps experience. You know, it was, it was great. It sure. It matured them. Mm -hmm. you know, it made them something. It gave them a different perspective in life. I know it gave me. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that's the way, you know, when they do, when they go through it, you have to live through it, you know, uh, but there it is. And you learn lots of life lessons. Well, did I ever? There's no question about that. Just, you know, had I, had I not had that experience, I probably would have broken that. Uh, had I had, you know, but I had that, that back, I always knew I had that background, you know. And there's another story, too, about, uh, when I was, uh, oh, when I was, when I, when I retired, I made the mistake of becoming a substitute teacher. So I went to, I got a job over there for a while in, uh, in uh, Winchester. And so I'm, uh, I, I go in and so forth, and so I went to the class and uh, I'm in the homeroom, and I'm saying, the kids are talking, no talking, you know, everything, everything is in line, rise and salute the flag and so forth. So as I'm leaving, this little colored kid says to me, he's not, not little, but he's a young guy, he's probably ninth grade, he said, hey, Mr. George, I said, yeah, were you in the Army? <laughs> I said, no, I was in the Marine Corps. But when I was at Winter of High School, later on during the Vietnam War, a lot of the teachers, they slacked off, and they, they didn't salute the flag or anything else. But when I, when I became chairman of the English department, they asked me once in a while if a teacher could be late or wouldn't be in, would I take the home room? I go into that home room, bell would ring, 8 o'clock bell. Everybody stand. They're looking at each other. Who is this guy? Everybody stand. Salute the flag of your country. And look, I said, salute the flag of your country. So we salute the flag of our country. And they thought I was some sort of uh, idiot, you know. 
But it, that, it started that. It started in the 60s, and then we see who it is today. But and uh, one other anecdote of this, I was watching, you know, during the 60s, terrible to watch uh, the, the, the students burning their uh, draft cards and everything. I see you know, uh, the stupid college kids, and what, what do you expect from them? But when they burn the American flag and waving the Viet Cong flag, I jeez. I went into the uh, recruiting station again, opposite South Station. I was about 34 now. And I said, uh, um, I was a former Marine, I want to rejoin. So he looks at me, he said, how old are you? I said, about 34. And he says, are you married? I said, yeah. Have children? I said, yeah, I have four. He said, get the hell out of here. <laughs> I said, <laughs> he, was a, he was a gunner, you know. So I said, okay. He said, look at, you know, you have a wife and children. I explained the situation. I said, is the major in? The major, well, he, was, he was the head man there. He said, look at, the major's not in, sir. He said, but he'll tell you the same thing I will. I said, you have a wife, you have four children, you're not going to do any more good, you know, than the going you're going at, at this particular juncture. So I said, okay. He said, thanks for coming in. I said, it's not simplifying. That was it. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for your service. Oh, well, thank, thank and, you, Jeff. Too. And, and I really appreciate you uh, coming in and sharing your service with us. Um,